The Jinji Indian is a very rare opening that's not seen a lot at the highest levels. And to me, as an advocate of the opening, that's absolutely fantastic because not a lot of people are studying it. And why is this? Well, part of the reason is, in the background, there have been rumors and murmurs about, oh, that opening's been refuted. But I doubt anyone could actually tell you what the, quote, refutation was. I actually prefer an opening that's not in the glare of the theoretical spotlight. Uh, much less attention is paid to it. People don't have the latest Anand or Kramnik or Kasparov game to follow in terms of looking how to play against it. So many white players are very, very unprepared to meet it. And yet, it offers a dynamic imbalance. At a very early stage, black gives up his bishop, he doubles white c pawns. In databases, against almost every response, black has at least 50%, which is pretty amazing. And white does have a broad number of responses. However, there's only two or three responses that we actually consider to be theoretically challenging, uh, perhaps e4, some attempts with h4, and an early queen a4. These look to be the most challenging theoretically, and in each case, we will show you how to handle the position with black. With a careful study of this chess DVD, you will learn the plans, the tactics, the history of the Jinji Indian, and you will be able to win many, many games against very surprised white opponents. Today we're going to look at a fantastic opening that you can play when white plays 1d4. It's called the Jinji Indian, named after Roman Jinjin Hashvili. And it starts when white plays 1d4. d4 is a very good move for white. It helps to control the center. And we can see the e5 and the c5 squares. And with black, we respond with 1g6. We prepare to fianchetta our bishop to g7. White plays c4 and establishes a very nice pawn duo. This gives him control of e5, d5, c5, and b5 for the moment. For black, we fianchetta our bishop and we immediately begin to put pressure on white's d4 pawn. White plays knight to c3. This developing knight move has been chosen by white players about 67% of the time. From c3, we can see the knight influences the d5 and the e4 squares. And now, as black, we counterattack at the center. Our pawn on c5, combined with our bishop on g7, puts pressure on white's d4 pawn and immediately forces him to make a decision. d5 has been white's choice about 80% of the time. From d5, we can see that the pawn covers the c6 and the e6 squares, but this also opens up for our fianchettoed bishop on the dark squares and gives us the option of bishop takes knight check. In fact, this is kind of a key moment in establishing our Jinji Indian defense is we do in fact give up our long range bishop for the knight on c3. After bishop takes c3 check, b takes c3, we can see white has these double pawns on c3 and c4 and White is ready to expand in the center with e2 to e4. And black also has these dark squares that are a little bit weak now because of the absence of his bishop that was on g7. With f5, we immediately fight for the light squares, and in particular, the vitally important e4 center square. And this is the key starting position for the Jinji Indian. If allowed, black will now play d6, knight f6, Queen a5, knight bd7, and then this is important. For d7, this knight can either go to e5 if available, as a rule, you want to go to e5 if it's available, or to b6. In either case, we can see that this knight immediately attacks the white pawn on c4. So let's say, for example, we have to put our knight on b6, then the way we follow up our development is with bishop d7 and castles. This is the development plan for black. From here, he may look to advance his e-pawn. He may look to drop his queen back, attack the uh, white pawn on c4. And uh, black has, you know, very, very good position. Now, of course, we made several moves for black. White will be trying to do something in the meantime. And what we will look at in this introduction is that once we reach this position with f5, we know what our plan is. We know where our pieces belong. We know what we're trying to uh, do but it takes two people to play a chess game. We will then take a look to see what white does 
and we will meet each of his plans. So in this DVD, we will show you how to play the Genji Indian, and we will cover all of the different pawn moves that White has on the six moves to try and uh, make progress against our fantastic opening. The first White response we will look at is 6e3. I call this the, quote, passive approach. But nonetheless, a lot of players do play like this. And what's White's reasoning? Well, first he develops a pawn in front of his king, and he likes to get his bishop to d3, maybe his knight to f3, and try to develop the king side. A lot of players, when first confronted with an opening they're not familiar with, they quite often play a move like e3. Now, what's the downside to e3? Well, e3 blocks in the queen's bishop. As we can see, the bishop only has this square, d2, and b2. Once you play e3, you've really blocked this, this guy in. Notice that f4, g5, and possibly h6 have all now been blocked by the white pawn on e3. Kind of reminds me of Edward Gufeld mentioned that you should talk to your pieces. White should actually ask the bishop on c1, Mr. Bishop, do you mind if I put a pawn on e3 and block your diagonal? If you were to have a conversation like that, I don't think too many players would play e3, but at the moment, you meet e3 fairly frequently. Players that haven't given a lot of deep thought, quite often this is the type of move they will play. So we understand with e3, white wants to develop his kingside pieces. How should we as black meet this plan or development setup for white? Well, we should play d6. The pawn on d6 immediately blocks the white pawn and frees the d7 square for our pieces. We should bring our knight out to f6. From f6, it controls the e4 and g4 squares. We should play our queen to a5. On a5, we immediately put pressure on the pawn on c3. We should bring our other knight to b to d7. From d7, we see it can go to b6 or to e5 if possible, and put more pressure on the white c4 pawn. But let's say we have to put our knight on b6. Let's say the e5 square is covered by white. Then our bishop normally goes to d7. From d7, it covers the b5 square, the a4 square, and prepares for our king to be able to castle queenside. More times than not, we will actually castle queenside where we have more pieces and a very nice fortress. And then from there, what's our game plan? Our game plan quite often is to break in the center with e6, just activating our bishop, and sometimes we drop the queen back to a6 where it helps the knight put more pressure on the white c pawn. That's our game plan. In game one, we're going to take a look at this game plan for black in action. <laughs>